Stop studying like every little bit of the material you're studying counts. I mean, it does count, but some parts matter a heck of a lot more than others. Not all of the parts of the course you're studying are built equal, and therefore your studying shouldn't be built equal either. This is the 80-20 principle. So in the 19th century, there was this dude called Vilfredo Pareto, who was just going about his life when he kept on seeing examples again and again of how 80% of the results come from around 20% of the causes. He noticed that 80% of Italy's land was owned by 20% of the population, that 20% of a plant contains 80% of the fruit, and even how 20% of your actions contain 80% of your results. And I've thought of at least four different ways that this concept applies to studying, the first being the exam board's favourites. When you're out there in the wild doing your past papers, you might stop for a moment and go, huh, I've done like five papers and this is like the 20th bloody time that this topic has come up. These are the exam board's favourites. 20% of the topics you study will come up at least once in 80% of the papers. If you do not learn these 20%, respectfully, you are cooked. But you know, it's not that simple. It's not always that you're going through a paper and then realise, oh, this topic keeps on coming up. And in that case, even in that case, I am telling you that the 80-20 principle still applies. And in today's day and age, we literally have robust automated systems that can figure out these things for us. Let's take a look. So I downloaded six sociology GCSE past paper twos onto my computer, then told ChatGPT to analyze the topics and questions that come up the most. Voila. Do you guys see that detailed analysis that would have taken me maybe even an hour of going back and forth between all the six papers? AI just did it for me in a few minutes. AI is certainly controversial. I will probably make an entirely different video on this. AI can be used to harm your education. It can also be used to help too, like in this case. But the sad thing about this particular method is that you can only use it if you have a large bank of past papers readily available to you, at you, for you. And if you do not, you may want to use the next step instead. Fundamentals, okay? I spoke a little bit about this topic in my infamous maths isn't hard, it's misunderstood video, where I basically explained that one of the reasons why maths is so misunderstood is because there are people out there that are trying to do simultaneous equations before they have their six times tables memorized. There is a particular order in which you should learn things. And the sad thing is that sometimes teachers don't pick up on when one student or when nearly the entire class doesn't have that key bits, those key pieces of the fundamentals down and just push on with flipping, I don't know, binomial distribution when most of the class probably couldn't even tell you what a binomial is. The most effective way of doing this is probably by mapping out your subject as a pyramid. For instance, I'm gonna do this for English language A-level, which I currently take. So at the bottom of the pyramid, I'd put things like word classes. This is a noun, this is an adjective, this is an epistemic modal verb. Because without this key terminology, you basically can't analyze anything in any of your papers. And if there's like key bits of terminology and key definitions in your subject, you'd usually put that at the bottom of the pyramid, especially if it's something that you need to answer nearly every question. In the middle of the pyramid, I'd put something like theory, Chomsky's nativism, Skinner's behaviorism. I'm not going to board you with my nerdy linguistic things because it's really good to know them. You should know them, but you're not completely cooked if you don't have all of them memorized. And at the very top of the pyramid, at least for, oh, I just did the Illuminati signal. Sorry. <coughs> and at the very top, at least for English language, it stops being, um, it stops being knowledge based and it starts being a lot more skills based instead. It's the ability to write a compelling essay using all of your academic formal, vo formal vocabulary and find convincing reasons why this base adjective is representative of a patriarchal society or something. Yeah, English language is pretty sick. I think that I'll do one of those, like, you know, like the video I did for maths, but on English, because I have a lot to say about English, obviously. But I'm getting carried away. If we want a video on specifically that top bit, I'm not going to do the, the, the Illuminati signal again. Um, But if we want a video on that top section, I can provide you with such if you 
comment that you want it. My point is, okay, without that original base of knowledge, okay, if I can't identify a common noun, I can't then use the next layer of the pyramid to add theory to that common noun in an exam. And then I can't add that next layer of trying to tie my reasoning back to context in a convincing way. These things stack on top of one another. And that's why that 20% bit of fundamentals is also responsible for 80% of the results later. If you want to pause the video and make your own subject pyramid, ask yourself these questions. What piece of knowledge do I need to answer most of the questions? What piece of knowledge is helpful to know but not necessary to answer all of these questions too? But it's even more helpful when there's some kind of learning program that does the work for you and teaches you the content in the order that makes the most sense to learn. And that's where the sponsor of today's video comes in. Brilliant. Brilliant helps you become a better thinker and a better problem solver with thousands of interactive visual lessons in maths, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Now, we just spoke about the fundamental 20% that you need in order to answer 80% of the questions. Brilliant is specifically designed to teach you the fundamentals, aka the 20%, before you go into all of the crazy bits. Now, for maths, Brilliant has obviously got you covered. There is a whole new updated course with a key focus on problem solving and mathematical intuition. And these concepts that you learn aren't like those weird topics you learn in maths that you never end up applying to your real life. All of these problems are grounded in realism with only the most useful and relevant concepts being taught. And because I am simply the best, I did hook you guys up with a deal. If you scan the barcode or click the link in the description, you can start learning on Brilliant for free today. And if you choose to dive deeper with an annual subscription, you can get 20% off. Head to brilliant.org forward slash girl in world to start learning for free today. And if you choose to join with an annual subscription, you can get 20% off. Now, the next one of the examples to the 80-20 rule is probably the most difficult because it 100% relies on you and your own honesty with yourself. 80% of the errors that you make in the exam are likely to come from 20% of your own personal weaknesses. Topics you forgot to revise, concepts you never quite understood, flashcards you just didn't get enough time to review. By far the easiest way to identify this is to get the entire topic list for your subject, okay? Either go on Google if your specification is public or go and bug your teachers about it. Send those emails, ask them after class. Get that entire subject list and I want you to go in and rate your confidence with it using the colors red, amber, yellow, green. Green being, if this came up in the exam, 100% minimum. Yellow, maybe 80%. Amber, feeling quite iffy on it, maybe 50, maybe a bit lower. And then red being absolutely no flipping idea. Anything amber or red are where you will lose the majority of marks. We go to the red topics. And then when we finish all of the red topics, we go to the amber topics. And then when we finish the amber topics, yellow and so on. I mean, you don't really need to review the greens if you're that confident in them, but you get what I'm trying to say. But this is only part of the equation, okay? Now that you've identified what topics to study, if you're looking for exactly how to study this, I will link a video here using a simple four-part method that you can use to study. Additionally, okay, applying the Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle to time spent studying, gives us some interesting findings. 20% of the time you spend studying will often end up producing 80% of your final grade. That's crazy. Faffing about or not getting to the absolute core of what you need to study is often what produces this. But you know what else produces this? Giving yourself unlimited time to study or just an unreasonably long time to study or study deadlines that are just too long. Okay, it's human nature to leave cramming and revising for the exam at the very last minute. And in my opinion, it's not even inherently a bad thing. When you revise at the last minute, 
you know you're desperate. You know you don't have time to reorganize your pencil case or underline your title in three different colored pens or passively read over a chapter in a textbook that you have already memorized. When you strip away time and give yourself limits, you often end up creating amazing results. But you don't have to wait for the week before the exam to give yourself those limits. That's what regular people do and we're trying to beat the regular competition okay often what i do before exams is i create a buffer period which is often like a week where it's the week before the exam if i were to sit the exam today the exam being in a week i'm confident that i'd ace it I prepare myself as though I was going to sit it a week earlier than everyone else, which in turn makes me so much more focused during study sessions because I've convinced myself that I've got a week less than everyone to revise. Then when that last week comes in and everyone's cramming, I'm chilling. I can chill. I want to make a more detailed video on my full revision scheme that I would do like a month before the exam. So let me know in the comments if you want it. But that's more long term, right? This applies in the short term too. Don't give yourself five hours to study five or six topics. Just start with one topic and give yourself one hour. Tell yourself after this one hour is up, or however long, it doesn't have to be an hour. There's no time to faff around, okay? I've got to move on to the next topic, no matter what I've done. You will find that in a study session like that, you are so much more productive because you have given yourself that limit and your brain will try to do everything it can to fit inside of it. Okay, so we know we need to study with a limit. But how do we even know like what time of day to study and for how long should I study? Should I make a study schedule? This video is here to answer all of those questions.